Um, so I will talk about um, stabilized Wilson fermions in action. Um, a little pun there. This is about the newly developed variant of Wilson closeover fermions, and I just want to give you an overview of what's been happening there. Uh, I want to touch upon three topics. I don't know if I'm going to go through all of them, but I think uh, uh, just the main parts I think will be interesting for you to see. Um, I'm also very excited that this is a more numerically focused workshop, so I can skip most of the physics. But more, but still, I think it is it is important to 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 remember that um, actually we are in, in a pretty good time for lattice QCD for HEP. Um, that we are in a time where non-perturbative precision inputs are very very important, where we have current and also next generation experiments which continue to probe nature, and that we are seeing tensions with the standard model at the few sigma level even though they tend to, to disappear. But the reason they disappear is because we understand QCD better. The key is really understanding QCD, and this is where lattice QCD really comes in and is the tool to do QCD without any further approximations. So the lattice community is, is, is dip, uh, supplying all of these decay constants and standard observable, observables as extreme precision. Um, while we are also more confident in doing complicated things like certain resonances and certain exotic hadrons, and also going towards uh, in interesting results uh, concerning inclusive and exclusive decay rates, some of the really important questions that we're trying to tackle today. And uh, here I just give like, like an overview of all the amazing experiments that these inputs really help, uh, that they need these inputs. Um, but this is, as I said, not going to be what, we are go what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk more on technical work using these stabilized Wilson fermions. And also, uh, I will only include status updates until the lattice conference. So I will reference some talks in the conference, but so you can look them up there. Um, even though everybody here is, a, is somehow related to lattice gauge theory or lattice QCD, I think it's still useful to, to, to remind oneself that uh, so lattice QCD is an Apinitio approach using supercomputers fundamentally. So, so we use computing. Um, what it does is we discretize QCD on a space-time grid. Great, that's a Lagrangian approach with all the drawbacks that that comes with and all the advantages that that comes with. Um, it is consistent at all energies. It has Euclidean signature, which is related to the Lagrangian approach, and it permits efficient polarization, which is the reason why we can use supercomputing in the first place. When we do these calculations and we calculate our configurations, ultimately what we will typically be doing in the second step is to actually evaluate the spectrum using some Euclidean correlation function. And when we do this, what we have, and everybody in the audience will know this, is we will evaluate our correlation functions either in terms of a sum of, our expon of exponentials and matrix elements in front, um, where we then would evaluate the long distance regime for just simple observables like the pion mass or the decay constant, or we would set up an interpolating operator GVP, which we would diagonalize to get all the excited state spectrum. If we've done that, then we can plug this into a finite volume scattering formalism to get out scattering phase shifts. An alternative way would be to uh, try to, uh, to solve a non numerically ill-posed um, inverse problem and to get out the spectral function directly. Uh, for example, the R ratio, or we also had a talk about the inclusive de decay rates that, that Shoji is, is, is suggesting, which is essentially this, this approach, trying to uh, approach this inver inverse problem. But that is all on the observable side. Once you've done this, you still need to somehow connect to physics, and that is you need to renormalize, you need to take the Chiron physical point limits. Uh, we heard a, a talk about this a minute ago taking the volume limit and also taking the continuum limit. So the things that we have to, the systematics, we have to demonstrate control over. We're doing QCD without approximations, but we need to demonstrate con uh, control over the cutoffs, the heavy, uh, the quark mass effects, and the finite volume effects. So having talked about observables, that is probably the only thing I will be talking about observables, I want to focus on the other thing, which is Oh, uh, better, better laser pointer. Fantastic, thank you. So the other thing, that is why I said it's very interesting to have a numerically folks workshop, workshop is because all of the successes that we've seen in the past, I would also, I would attribute to two things. One is improved theoretical tools like the spectroscopic method, like the GVP, like the finite volume quantization conditions, but also 
an extreme increase in, in availability and capability of generating gauge configurations that enable the control over these systematics in the first place. Finite volumes, big volumes, fine lattice spacings, physical quark masses, all things that were not possible, let's say, 20 years ago in, such, in, in this context and in this quantity. So I will say that actually the gauge configurations, the capability of generating gauge configurations is, is actually the engine, in a part, a significant part of the engine to the progress we've seen. And uh, to all of you, this is trivial. We generate configurations typically using a Markov chain Monte Carlo. That means we generate samples that are checkpoints in the Monte Carlo time. All of these together are an ensemble the number of samples that we have affects the statistical uncertainty. So the more configurations they have, we have, the, the better. What we typically see nowadays is, con is uh, ensembles with a thousand plus configurations that is somehow standard now. That also drives the precision that we've been reaching. But one thing that comes with this, since it is Markov chain Monte Carlo, is that we have to be very careful about autocorrelations. You have all observables that we ultimately measure are correlated in some way since they're generated from each other. So this is something that is very important. And I would say that the quality of the set of configurations kind of drives the accessible precision that you have. And in more simple terms or more concrete terms, the ensembles ultimately dictate what research we can and cannot do. For a lattice gauge theorist, I think new physics is if you have a good set of configurations, you can suddenly do new observables, PDFs and all this kind of thing is also because configurations are being become, becoming available that let us do this. Often it is really the stumbling block. You don't have the physical point fine enough ensembles to do certain things, G minus two being a very great example of this. And that is also why I want to talk about this as an example application, G minus two. Uh, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. Physics-wise, this is about the g-factor, which is that a muon spin precesses around in an external b-field, and the strength of this magnetic moment is, uh, is mu, proportional to the g-factor, which we convert into a mu, and this is, this is sensitive to all particle interactions, so explicitly also particle interactions that we have not included in the standard model. This is the motivation why we think of this as a standard model test and a probe for new physics. Today we say that there is a 4.2 discrepancy between the AMU determined experimentally and phenomenologically. I say phenomenologically here because in recent years, and it's kind of been started off with this BMW collaboration paper, lattice results are coming up that reduce this tension quite significantly. Uh, so BMW published this result, this result where AMU HLO, which is the most uncertain part which carries the largest uncertainty in the determination of the anomalous magnetic moment from the theory side, they, did it, they published a result whose accuracy is on a par with the phenomenological result. This is not so much a, a question of the average value, okay, that's the interpretation, but the error is there. The uncertainty, the control over all the systematics is at the level that it rivals phenomenological dis dis um, determinations. And this is possible, again, to these two things. You have the improved theoretical tools, which are not notably switching from the four momentum method to the TMR method, and using the bounding methods to find the window that you would sum over. Essentially, what you have to do is integrate over a, a bump, and you have to decide where to stop that integration, and uh, have to get to a formulation where you actually have a bump that you can sum up over, and that is what the, both these things are doing. Um, and the other thing that BMW has is a huge, a very large set of staggered configurations at physical, actually straddling the physical point, lower than physical mass and larger than physical mass so that they can do interpolations at many, many lattice spacings and volumes. So well, this is interesting because this is now a observable where the continuum limit is the main difficulty, the main thing to tackle. This is also, I think, in the community what was discussed most in this plot. Is this really a reasonable thing to do, how they did their continuum limit? So, currently, commonly, 
if we look at the available configurations, they are like in a regime of 0.05 Fermi's to 0.15 Fermi lattice spacing. So that's also the window that BMW is using. And so we'd say, well, if we want to check more about, learn more about the continuum limit, why don't we just generate more at finer lattice spacings? That should be possible. The problem is that, of course, this is not easy. This is e much, much easier said than done. There's a number of hard problems that we have to solve before we can do that in a good way. If we want to generate configurations, we have to, of course, um, Think about the discretization effects. Like the continuum of the extrapolation of actions is really not always clear. The staggered, the highly improved staggered actions are a great example of how you have to do a lot of work and have to have a lot of theoretical understanding before you can even dry, draw that line to go to the continuum limit. Higher order terms are often important, and I thought what was very interesting was the plenary by Nikolai Husum on the lattice about this, where he really studies this like for different actions, also for domain wall actions. What are the important terms? How do these continuum limits really behave? The next thing is um, stability issues. That is, when we actually generate configurations, we all know a lot of the technology involved is just to keep the thing from not crashing, from actually managing the solve, converging, having smooth evolutions through time, through Monte Carlo time. And this is in particular a difficulty when you want to go to physical pion masses. Because the fluctuations in the lowest eigenvalues, in the lowest Dirac eigenvalues, typically increase as you go to lower pion masses, so to lower quark mass. Um, this is often addressed by smoothing the, the, the background, i.e. smearing in the action. However, this is not always a silver bullet. And there's some evidence that this can lead to some extra difficulties in taking continuum limits and also in interpreting your results. And then finally, which is probably the most re relevant for, uh, for final lattice spacings, is that we have the phenomenon of critical slowing down. We had a really nice talk about that yesterday. But here I will focus more on the idea of the critical slowing down or the autocorrelation length of updating topological charge explodes. So as you go finer, the tunneling probability um, here, this is just uh, to distinguish the A, um, I put it in brackets. The lat as the lattice spacing goes down, the tunneling prob probability to a new topological sector drops and the topology freezes. This is, we had this really nice talk by Matsumoto yesterday about this, so you should, should have a good idea. What, what, what was perhaps not highlighted so much is that if you freeze, you can't ignore this because if you are frozen in some fixed topological sector, this will induce effects on your observables at the order some, it's usually proportional to Q over V in some way. So your pion mass can be just completely off so you, because you're stuck in some high, high sector, which becomes even more important as you go to larger and larger lattice geometries since that will increase the average topological charge that you actually observe. So, to drive this even further home, um, I've kind of tried to sketch, and please don't be upset if your favorite lattice uh, collaboration is not in, the he in here. I've kind of tried to sketch like what kind of volumes and uh, pion masses we keep reaching nowadays. So on the left, I have a plot where I show the pion mass on the x-axis and I show the physical volume on the y-axis. And in, these, in this plane, what we actually want, we always want n pi l to be actually larger than 4, even though I've included here uh, the, the re regime n pi l 3 to 4. Um, five to, 4 to 5 is really great. The finite volume effects will not be that big. Uh, 5 to 7 is really optimal because like, the, uh, the finite volume effects should be very, very benign and very small for most observables. This is an observable dependent statement. So we should, would want our configurations to be somehow in these bands. And in the darker shades, I've kind of like tried to give an idea, a sketch of what we commonly are route reaching. Commonly means like any old medium-sized lattice effort has these kind of configurations at their disposal, while state-of-the-art groups will have like these, this broadened band. Here I've drawn another line, which is also a rule of thumb, is that what you actually want, you also want your physical volume to not dip below three Fermi's in size. But that is just a rule of thumb. So we really, we really want to be sampling here in this regime, but we are reaching that and the precision that we are having is coming really from here. 
if you go to another way of looking at this, where I put the pion mass again, um, where I put the pion mass on the y-axis this time, and I put the, um, discrete, the um, lattice spacing on the x-axis this time, lattice spacing squared, we also have a, a different view of this, like kind of tilted. So I ignore the volume information, and we also have like a very a popular window of where we are doing our simulation, somewhere between 0 0.05, 0 0.05 and 0 0.09 uh, uh, Fermi lattice spacing. That is really where most collaborations work. And then there's, of course, exceptional people who can go finer or go coarser, um, whereby here then you also have this problem kicking in that you can't go very light when you are um, when you're going coarse. So this, these two plots are meant to illustrate uh, certain cost bounds and walls that are difficult for us to, to, to go through. So one of the cost bounds in, on the finest A is just due to the lower bound volume constraints. We need these three Fermi's and we need m pi L larger than four at the physical point. So that is a very large lattice geometry right there. You will typically need 64 cubes, 96 cubes or larger to fulfill these. Then there's, of course, a trivial brown on the largest V. So this means that empire larger than six is also not really easy to get. It is very expensive to get. Um, then there are all algorithmic bounds, especially on the lightest empire, given at a coarse lattice spacing in particular, that it really is very difficult to go light, um, which limits our applications there. You would like to do nuclear physics at coarse lattice spacing, but at the physical pion mass, but that's precisely where running the algorithms is the hardest. And then you have the topology bound, um, or the critical slowing bound, or autocorrelation bound, when you want to go finer, because topology freezes, autocorrelation explodes, it becomes, in your most expensive simulation, where you have a large lattice geometry to fulfill this, you have also a long time to the next independent configuration. It makes it very, very hard to go Finer. And I think the entire community has realized this. There's much more activity, I feel, going on um, that was also highlighted at the Lattice Conference and also in this, this, uh, this conference here um, about especially going finer, especially topology freezing. Um, so that kind of sets the stage. The next thing I want to talk to you is about topology freezing in the sense of how can we address topology freezing. And one way you can kind of address it is by considering open boundary conditions. They are one way at addressing topology freezing. And what you do is you have a usual uh, lattice with periodic boundary conditions in space and anti-periodic boundary conditions in time. You just open those. You will set the gauge lengths to zero. And now topology can flow in and out. It's not confined, not, not stuck in your lattice anymore. Um, this is great. However, this induces boundary effects because your open boundaries effectory effectively act like a pion bath. So the other thing that you lose in this way is you lose time translation invariance. So close to the bound, you really feel these boundaries and close to the boundaries, your correlation functions, your spectra look different. And here's an example of how this looks in a pion with Wilson Clover fermions on a, on a very standard lattice. In red is the open boundary situation where I sit my source close to the boundary and in blue is the situation where I sit my source far away from the boundary and I measure the same correlation function. And in the effective mass we see that the centrally measured one plateaus much much earlier and this is in the pion. So if you imagine having a complicated noisy observable handling these boundary effects can be very very difficult. It can be actually a stumbling block to progress in that sense. So even though, in principle, open boundaries solve the freezing problem in some way, in practice, it means we can only measure in the central region of the lattice. We lose a lot of the lattice due to this. And the other thing is that when you're in the middle, so this is a diffusive effect. The topology is diffusing in and out. It takes a long time to diffuse into the middle. So if you made your, your length long, it could still be that your, your observables that you measured are actually still affected by a de facto frozen topology, while on the boundary it's changing happily. And at the same time, in hadron spectroscopy, what we typically do is we really rely on translational invariance. We really throw a lot of sources 
on our configurations, trying to make as much of the configurations that we generated there so expensive as we can. Throwing thousands of, of sources onto a single configuration is not uncommon today. So you really want to use as much of your translational invariance as, principle, uh, as possible. So it can seem a high price to lose this, even though uh, we are seeing successful programs with open boundaries. They typically have much more configurations, of course. I don't want to say that this is like a stump, is like a, a wall that you cannot surpass, but I do want to point this out that this is a this is an issue, and it might it it, it would be good to have have a solution that is translationally invariant. So that kind of sets the stage. That's a, the the end of my first part. So now let's go into the stabilized source and fermions. The name of this talk in the end. The, the, the work I will be showing in this section is, is old already, it's from 2020. And the team that was working on this is, is these four gentlemen here. And to give you a flavor to start is Wilson Fober Kermions are very popular. The reason they are very popular is that they're conceptually clear. clear. There are many advanced methods that have been built and uh, designed for with Wilson Clover fermions in mind. They're relatively cheap and they pose little restrictions on what observables can be measured. If you take in, in contrast the staggered action, for example, you cannot do certain baryons. Not a problem for Wilson fermions. At the same time, they're cheap. So you don't have to go full domain wall, which is a very expensive action. If you wanted to do nuclear physics, Domain wall is probably the last thing you want to do because you know that you have to throw thousands of inversions to beat the signal to noise ratio there. So having an expensive action is not that attractive. But if you are on the staggered action, then you would have to use some other valence action to do the same physics. So you can see why they are, they are popular, but they also have their own drawbacks because they're not automatically order A squared. They're just order A. So that means that you have to either go to finer A to do your, to do your simulation and your observable so that you can control the, uh, the continuum limit, or you have to invest extra time to do the improvement, to improve this rigorously up to A square. Um, in this, if you go this way, because this might be too expensive or uh, might take too much time, then you have to, of course, deal with autocorrelations auto and engaged configuration, just as everybody else. But I think in Wilson Clover, this is particularly pressing. Um, then, in, uh, then without the chiral symmetry, which is also one of the reasons why it is only on aura A, you have a problem which is somehow a little bit unique, which is something you don't really see in domain wall or in staggered, is that you can have exceptional configurations. That is, you have configurations where the lowest Dirac eigenvalue becomes very close to zero. And that will, that will lead to a problem in your generation process. And this becomes especially a problem when you are coarse and going light, because the lightness of the quark mass increases the fluctuations, while the, uh, the yeah, yeah, this increases the fluctuations uh, in the coarse and light regime. So you are more likely to actually fluctuate down to one of these zero modes, um, which will then cause a problem for you. This can, can show up in different ways. This can show up in your solver just crashing, or it can show up in a really weird looking pion, for example, if you do actually manage to solve. Um, it, it, this is a, a situation you kind of really want to avoid. Um, the other thing that can happen um, is that since our algorithms are exact, but our precisions are not, what can happen is that when you do your integrations in your hybrid Monte Carlo, is that you can accumulate integration errors over time. That can also happen. Um, so you can also lose precision when you're doing your global sum. This is because especially important when your lattice becomes big. When you're summing over a huge global volume, then precision does matter, and rounding errors can cause a problem, especially because this then goes into your accept reject. Um, and this, is, this was one of the motivations that pushed us into the stabilized Wilson fermion because at the time we were working on this, we were thinking of really large volumes. We wanted to do these master fields, which I will talk about later on. We wanted to do really, really large volumes. And for that, you need an extraordinarily stable setup. Um, you cannot have any volume fluctuations kick you off and stop your generation. You can't have any pathologies coming up. And, uh, this, uh, and the way we came up with a algorithm that would be fit 
for very large volume simulations is that we connected two, two sections. One is an algorithmic improvement section and one is a fermion discretization uh, section. One thing that we will do, and I will show a little bit in a minute, is the, that we will use the stochastic molecular dynamics or algorithm over the HMC, but they are related, I will show in a minute. What this does is decreases the fluctuations, uh, the, the uh, jumps that your um, simulation can take in Monte Carlo in phase space. Um, this has been shown to show a net gain in reduced autocorrelation, uh, autocorrelations at the same cost as the traditional HMC. Um, but I would argue in any case, it is a more stable option because you cannot have this spice in delta H. I will come back to that in a minute. Um, we also increase the precision of the internal numbers for the accept, reject in particular for our global sums. We really don't want to be affected by, by, by rounding errors. And the other thing is we will use a supremum norm, um, and I will explain that in a minute too. Plus we will use a different fermion uh, discretization, um, which I will explain. On. All of this is implemented in OpenQCD 2.0 onwards, so you can switch between the two versions and check for yourself. And all of this goes on top of the already existing um, highly tuned and highly advanced algorithms that are uh, provided in OpenQCD. I want to say at this point, all of this preserves the perturbative expansion, which is important for renormalization. I mean, this, there is no smearing here. You can add smearing if you want to. But currently, we are trying to push this framework as far as we can without having to smear. Ultimately, the smearing introduces extra sets of parameters that we have to tune. We want to try to see how far we can get without. Um, and also, this is a ch only a local change in action. This is not, this is not some, some, some unlocalized thing we're doing here. So, use the SMD. So one thing that we have in the HMC is that you can have these possible jumps in phase space directory which can be far away from the trajectory you're following because the length of the HMC evolution is rather long. So this can happen, this can have many reasons. One of them could be accumulated integration errors, could be, um, but this is one that is easy to address. And when that happens, when your trajectory has been bumped off you have to basically re this back to the trajectory that you're wanting to go, go along. You could even be bumped off far enough to go along a different phase-based trajectory if, you want, if, if it's really big jump. An alternative approach is to use this stochastic molecular dynamics um, approach, which was already suggested quite a long time ago. And the big change here is that this is an algorithm somewhere between a Langevin and an HMC. Actually, there's a control parameter that will actually choose how close you are to a Langevin, and how close you are to an HMC. And that means that you retain somehow this randomness of walking through phase space, but at the same time, a memory of where you came from. And what you happen, what the big, big change is that instead of refreshing your momentum fields and your pseudo fermions with, a ra with just a random number, with a random momentum field, you instead perform a random field rotation. Then you do a very short molecular dynamics evolution, you do an accept, reject, and you repeat. The benefit of this is that this, so this is an exact algorithm, just like the, and the limit of it is in fact the HMC. It's shown to be ergodic for small epsilon parameters, which controls the step width, and it reduces these violations of delta H. You don't have these big jumps anymore. And in principle, you have shorter autocorrelation times, but I said that this is not that important. If I wanted to give you a picture of this, this is my best artistic attempt at doing so. If you have the HMC on the left-hand side and you think of the, each step as being like a cone, and I, in a cone, the, 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 the depth of the cone at the other hand being determined by uh, uncertainties in your, in your evolution, uh, um, accumulated, rounding errors and integration errors. Um, you step along through phase space like this and then, oops, you have a jump. And you go away, you have to re-thermalize back. I think all of us have observed this eh, in practice. And the idea is that in the SMD, you have a much smaller such jump and you can follow this trajectory more easily. And the reason it cannot, it is forbidden twice from going jumping far away is first of all the trajectory length is short and the second of all is that it can't just go randomly. It, 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 it can only be rotated, the momentum can only be rotated randomly and not, you know, not the entire field. Um, 
This goes on top of our volume independent norm. Volume independent norm means that when we have our L2 norm, it, what we typically do is we just average basically the, the quality of the solution of, your, uh, of our Dirac solve. So this is a question of the inversion. But what if on a single few sites we have a large spike? This will r move the mean, but it will probably be largely averaged out by the rest of the volume. Now, if you imagine having a huge volume, you ca can have a pretty pathological catastrophic spike, the spike loss in precision localized in your configuration, which your accept reject will not notice and also your solver will not notice. But once you do your physics, you very likely will notice. So um, the idea is that instead of doing an averaging, uh, we uh, instead uh, uh, consider an upper bound. Every solve, every locally, every solve has to be better than this precision. So that is what we call this uh, su supremum norm, and in that way it also becomes volume independent. And the next thing is what I mentioned is to use uh, quadruple precision global sums, just so that we don't have any rounding up or any uh, errors just from in our accept reject. Again, this is important when your volume becomes big. When you have a small, small volume, this is probably not important at all. The final thing is, the, is where we really change, and we can't really say that this is a Wilson-Clover fermion anymore, because here we change the action. The final thing we change is we write down the Wilson-Clover action. And remember, I told you about these uh, anomalous slow eigenmodes. They have, in the Wilson-Clover action, there's actually two sources of this. There's the standard Wilson term, and then there's the Clover term. I think those who have been around longer will re remember times in the, in, in the quenched world where it was noticed that somehow Wilson-Clover is harder to do. The, the calculations are not as smooth. The, the kappas are, are more difficult to determine. And that is actually due to this also being a possible source of, the, um, of these anomalous low Dirac eigenvalues. And um, this can only be the case if the spectrum of the Clover op operator is actually unbounded. And funnily enough, um, this is where what, what Martin then worked out, is he realized that this had not been checked and the Clover operator is actually, the spectrum is actually unbounded. So it can take any volume. And it can increase, in, in particular, it can contribute to having an exceptionally low eigenmode. So there is some more information here. When you, this becomes especially uh, visible when you cast it in the even odd con, con, preconditioned form, where you then have to perform an inverse of the DOO. When, this, uh, when the bound, when the clover term leads to a anomalously low eigenvalue, this is the probability of that happening actually scales with the volume and it becomes more probable when the volume is big. So what happens when you go to very, very large volumes using the standard Wilson clover is that your clover won't invert. This is of course when you're using even odd preconditioning, you say, well, I throw away even odd preconditioning. But the point is that this is a property of the unboundedness of the Wilson of the clover. So even if you're not interested in inverting the clover term at any point in your fancy algorithm, it is still something to keep in mind. This is unbounded and it will contribute to the uh, occurrence of exceptionals. So that is the, the stabilized part here. And um, oh, uh, then I went a little bit fast. So we implemented all of this and said, okay, this, but this can go both ways. These extra terms in the exponential could break everything. You might not be able to see to see your order A improvement or any of those things. So it, this needed a test. And that is what we did in this first paper. We, we simulated three flavor um, dynamical stabilized Wilson fermions. And the first thing we had to do is tune the clover coefficient. This we did in the Schrödinger functional with the two actions. And the black line here is the stabilized Wilson fermions and the dotted line is the standard Wilson Clover action where we took the CLS results in comparison. And uh, this was very encouraging because what we saw is that this is the inverse lattice spacing, uh, the inverse coupling, is that at coarser lattice spacing, the clo Clover coefficient is smaller. The, the, the Clover coefficient is closer to perturbation theory. That's good. 
Um, so this was very, very positive, uh, and it uh, made us study um, also some chiral effects. We went to, this is phi 4, which is the, the m pi times 2 plus mk summed and averaged. Um, and we discuss, we try to understand at three lattice spacings, how does this scale, this quantity scale, with um, uh, in the two different actions. This is just measure to measuring relative discretization effects. This is not global discretization effects, nothing over the continuum limit. This is just relative mass discretization effects. And what we saw is that here is the stabilized Wilson fermion at 0.994 fermis and the comparable uh, Wilson clover results. And we see that the 0.94 fermi kind of lines up in quality with 0.086. So we are coarser and we have relative discretization effects on a par with a slightly finer standard uh, simulation. This was really exciting to us. Um, and also when we look at the plaquette, we see on the, in the exponentiated clover, we see somehow a, a very smooth kind of set of fluctuations while in the corresponding standard clover. This is using the SMD algorithm as well, by the way, uh, we see more fluctuations. So it's really the, all of them together, going back to the question of which one is more important, all of them together. The entire toolkit is what stabilized Wilson fermions is. It's not just the E clover. But this was so exciting that we um, founded a new team, uh, the Open Lattice Initiative. We've been just posting uh, uh, lattice proceedings so far. But what, what we've been doing is we really want to put this into action now. We really want to generate ensembles with this now. And really may, and um, so our idea is really to generate state-of-the-art ensembles with this. Um, and provide them immediately. Um, so this is my plot from before. This is the, 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 um, the plane that was like this before, just tipped on the side. So these are the volume constraints, and these high rises are the number of configurations roughly we have at these points. And what you're, try what you're seeing is that we're really trying to populate as much in this, this area that we like, above three Fermi's um, in these uh, four four to six um, MPIL bands and going as chiral as possible. Everything that has just a shaded band is something we are tuning currently, and everything that has a high rise is something where we're producing configurations right now. Um, we have a bit of a strategy behind it, is that we are going to generate 500 plus configurations at the ASU three flavor symmetric points. That's complete. Actually, we have 1,000 everywhere for four, five, four plus one, five lattice spacings. Um, then we're going to add um, 302 MeV, 200 MeV pion masses, that's what we're currently tuning and starting to produce, and then we're gonna to go to the physical point. Uh, this is a typo, I mean, of course, 135 MeV, um, which is something we're tuning at the moment. Um, this is, of course, a, an effort that is very focused. Oops, that's the wrong direction. Um, we have a bunch of uh, quality criteria, and since I only have five minutes left, I will just bunch uh, not, not talk about these. This is something you can look on the slides later on. This is what we say is this is what the configuration, the Monte Carlo chain has to fulfill, because of course the algorithm is complicated. To tune the stability, we have to also have our own quality criteria. This is what it has to fulfill for us to accept it as being uh, of quality. We have some resources and we have, a, have had some nice talks. And not all of them are from us, which is very nice. So we have a, a little bit unique publication strategy, which is that um, each completed phase is accompanied by a reference publication where everything will be made openly available. But we also have, and there will not be any embargo time. However, if you want to use your configurations while we are generating them, uh, you can also get in touch with us. And what this creates is a situation where we have that simple and complex observables are kind of being published at the same time. We have m pi and, uh, and m omega coming at the same time as the h dibaryon, because the users are doing these more advanced things already, while we are still working on many of the basics. And uh, this is also a way where we think we can catch up, because Wilson Clover has been around since inception of Lattice QCD, while we are kind of new, and uh, to make it palatable for people to think about this and to, to do a switch or to consider um, if this is not a useful um, approach, we want to make the configurations at least available because that's what people don't have. Um, and one really exciting example driving home the benefits of the stabilized Wilson fermions is this study actually on the H-dibaryon, which was done by the Baryon scattering collaboration, 
which I'm also a part of, but was presented by Jeremy Green and again by Amy Nicholson. And what is shown here is the binding energy of the H dibaryon, that is the UUDDSS dibaryon state. Binding energy determined using a GV pre approach, using CLS ensembles, and using the open lat ensembles. This is the pion mass, this is at the SU3 flavor symmetric point. And what was a huge surprise a few years ago is that the discretization effects were seen to be large, that the continuum limit was non trivial. So, in nuclear physics, the continuum limit is important, and that was a bit of a surprise. And now we, we can see that our stabilized Wilson fermions still exhibit this nice feature. The discretization effects are somehow smaller. We don't have a theoretical understanding effect of exactly why, but even in a complicated observable, this is the case. And by the way, I plot also the effective masses here, um, just to say like there is this thing out there uh, that, that the UDDSS could be a dark matter candidate. This is a model that's been propagated. I think Lattice says no, and has said no for a long time. Um, and these new results, I think, really show that with control of a continuum limit and all this systematics, this is an interesting uh, avenue for, for us to pursue. Okay, um, so that's just an overview. But what about topological freezing? I didn't talk about top topological freezing, and I have one minute, I guess. Um, so this is going to be about stochastic locality and massive field simulations. Um, just to give you the gist, the, all these ideas of over topological freezing um, have led to a one path which makes us look at sampling in a very different way. Where instead of looking at sampling in the sense of I generate a traditional volume, I generate read again, read again, read again, and I have all these checkpoints that I use as uh, my samples. What if we just had a massive volume? What if, if we had a huge, huge, huge volume? And then we could understand taking the expectation value, not as summing up over all of our samples, but doing translation averages, let's say in these like red boxes, um, across our one configuration or a handful of configurations. So what I will do is I will replace the usual expectation value with this double bracket, which is the sum of a volume over these blocks, which then has volume corrections. So if the volume is very, very large, these corrections will be very, very small. And my translational average and my Monte Carlo average will be the same in the limit of infinite volume. So in an extreme case, you just need one config. And that is what is called the master field. I am not as I, I, I'm not advocating saying that this is the best way forward. I'm saying that the that the combination of the two is very much worth exploring. Um, because the other thing is, if you have a very very large volume, remember that I said that the um, changes induced by the freezing of topology typically go as topological charge over the volume. So if you send volume to infinity or very, very large, these effects induced on your observable become irrelevant. So you're not solving the topological freezing problem, but you're trying to push it into an area where it doesn't matter. That is, the, that is one of the ideas here. You're trying to push these corrections, which go as one over view, v, below the statistical uncertainty, which goes as one over square root v. So it's a battle of uncertainties here. And I think the master field paradigm, since I'm out of time, is really about the, the, uh, the a battle of uncertainties. Can you push the, the contamination from topological effects below the error of, uh, below the uncertainty of your observable? Because then it does not matter. So, and there are different ideas about this. You can generate these things. You should look at the, ver the um, variation. As I said, it's all about the uncertainties. Position space methods are then very attractive, and here's some results on that. The other thing you can do is you can, instead of having a very big four-dimensional volume, you can just have one very long time direction. It doesn't matter which direction is long, as long as you have at least one. And the benefit of having this kind of setup is that you can still have the sparseness of the, of the, uh, of the spectrum, you can still use your GVP methods. This is something you can't do in a master field. Um, and this is what we call the long T approach. We studied it, and we found 
that, oh, wait, oops. I went up to lattice, uh, lattices of 2,304 points in the space time, in the time direction and only 48 in the space direction. Generating this was good fun and it worked, no problem. And we, um, and I could show that uh, this basically works, that you can get a topological susceptibility in a frozen setup that does not care. This one has a topological susceptibility of minus 50, this one has minus 12, and they give the same uh, charge, sorry, a charge of minus 50 of minus 12 and at 2,300 points, it doesn't matter. You get the same topological susceptibility. You can also do hadrons in this. The cool thing, if you have a very long time direction, there's no around the world effects. Yeah. Nothing is coming from 2,000 points to interfere with you. You can put multiple sources at the same time and invert like 10, 20 uh, propagators at the same time. That is possible. Oops, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm sorry for being so much over time. And the last thing is that, th may I have this point, this, just this slide, is that, you know, like, this goes back to the open boundaries, where I said that in the middle stuff doesn't evolve. This is just a feeling. This is what people kind of had an intuition about and saw in data. Now, you can actually quantify this, because in QCD there are no parity odd correlators. They are zero, stochastically zero. So the pseudo-scalar scalar correlation function should be stochastically zero. If there is contamin topological contamination, however, it is not zero. And in that case, it obtains a correlation function that decays with the pion mass. So if you plot the pseudo-scalar scalar meson correlation function, and you see an exponential decay that is decaying with m pi, you're seeing precisely this kind of topological, um, this topological contamination, and it would scale with q over v. And that's what, exactly what we see. We have a, if we set our periodic boundary conditions, that is the magenta, uh, yellow and blue, you see this. And you also see this, and this is probably the most surprising or the um, most common, nicest result, is that you also see this in open boundaries. The red data here that is doing even worse than my 2,300 point result, that data is on open boundary condition ensemble, where I've measured in the middle. While the green data is if I measure at the boundary. So you really see this effect. Yes, open boundaries do exactly what they're supposed to do if you measure on the boundary. But if you measure in the central region, that is really not the case and it is much more complicated relation. And that is at least um, I try to plot the amplitudes here, and I can show that, well, if you're measuring in the central region, you can also use a long T ensemble and beat that. Um, so from that point of view of controlling this, this would be an alternative approach. And thank you, and sorry for going so much over time and having to skip so much material. This is the first time I'm giving this talk, so I will have to adapt a little bit. But anyways, thank you for your attention, and I'm open for any questions.